And then we got signs. Yeah. I that's only if we use the pitch up card. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think the problem is to keep stuff in it. And I told you something. Hey, let's should we blast anything out on social media for the new live stream? Our social media. But I'm, I'm posting the new link in the one um, because it says some people are reading, so I'll just direct it. But we're good to go. Yes, it's not in New York, here in the DC, and so on. Yeah, 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 is this the one that no that was four hours I think that's the more important thing right now. Did you post it on the Lip Center one or the PSL Center? Um, both, but one second. I'm going to put it in the comments first. Hey, Jim, yeah, what's the secret? I don't know. I'm trying to say something that if people want to get so we all just do the whole thing. So even though all the cars go home, they should go on it. I don't think it's just a good thing. I was so talking about it. I was so talking about it. Yeah, just yeah. Yeah. Cool. So it's good. Yeah, yeah. 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 Y
Everybody, yeah, we're, we're going to get started in about five minutes. We're just working out a few things with the live stream. So there are snacks down there and plenty of merch. So if you want to circulate for the next five minutes, otherwise, we'll get going in a few weeks. No, let me just retire. We'll be talking about the private council campaign and it's talking to the other people. Right, right, right. Do you like they need us? I would think so. I mean, I just think it's the period of the people. But you can use the most recent social media. You need to be able to do that. You need to be able to do that. I got PR for a lot of friends. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I'll tell you. So, got to be a good friend. It was already in the case. Cool. Just from last season. This is yeah, just yeah. Well, I'm going to keep it Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks for being patient. China's revolution and a quest for a socialist future is coming out this May. And China and the World, 1949 to 2022, Conversation from the Socialist Program, a book that he's authoring, co-authoring with Brian Becker, 
will be published later this year. We plan to have Dr. Pound back in the fall to celebrate these new books, so please stay tuned for information about that. Finally, I want to thank the organizations and the people who contributed to make, making Dr. Hammer's visit here to Philadelphia possible. The Philadelphia Liberation Center for Socialism and Liberation, the Critical Theory Workshop, and Karen Hollis in the Cultural Studies Program at Villanova University. This event is being live streamed and those watching online can submit questions for the Q&A. It is also being recorded and will be uploaded to the Critical Theory Workshop's YouTube page. Now, before Dr. Hammond's talk, Ming is going to briefly speak about the struggle uh, currently going on here in Philadelphia's Chinatown. Don't be afraid. Come out front if you. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, my name is Ning and I'm a, an organizer with Party for, Socialism. So, Party for Socialism and Liberation here in Philly and the Liberation Center. Um, so currently I am involved with the struggle uh, that's based in Chinatown. Um, as most of us know, uh, the billionaire owners of the 76ers team partnered up with another billionaire named David Edelman, who's a tourist developer. Um, in trying to build a new home arena for the 76ers basketball team uh, right on the border of Chinatown. And, you know, speaking from history and experience, uh, we know that this construction sand will almost, like, you know, utterly erase our beloved Chinatown from our city center. Um, you know, like, you might wonder why that's relevant, like, why, you know, the gentrification and eradication of Chinatown is related to um, Dr. Ken's uh, speech on uh, China, Chinese socialism, and the U.S. War, uh, aggression on China um, and Asia Pacific. Um, so, so as Marxist Leninist, Leninist here at like the so and Center, we understand that capitalist exploitation is inherently, you know, critical in our the foundations to imperialism. It's like um, as the U.S. continues to dehumanize Chinese people and by extension. Asian people, um, you know, the media pumping out anti-China and racist propaganda constantly and blurring what's really happening on the ground in China and in Asia in general. The capitalist uh, billionaires and exploiters and developers are banking off of that, you know, that hate and that disregard for our friends, neighbors, um, and our fellow citizens. Um, you know, they can't really build this arena and stay like written house in a predominantly wealthy and white neighborhood, right? Because there'll be massive um, opposition um, against that, both people in power as well as residents. However, um, the residents of Chinatown mostly are working class, poor, racialized, you know, Chinese Asian people. Um, these, you know, wealthy and powerful people are really just uh, baking off of. Um, the ongoing propaganda to the yeah. nation. And yeah. by extension, you know, China Trump disappearing across um, the United States, um, there'll be less and less of these.
get that as the Q and A part. That'll be great as well. And basically, what I want to do is look at, on the one hand, this term socialism with Chinese characteristics, in particular, what is with Chinese characteristics. And then uh, uh, after after talking about that just a bit, I want to take uh, the rest of the time and talk about the new era. What what does the new era mean? Uh, and of course, that that involves thinking about what was the old era, what was the previous period, because the the new era comes in contrast with that, and that and it helps us to understand the situation in China today, to reflect a little bit on on how things came to be the way they are now. So. With Chinese characteristics, this is a phrase that goes all the way back to the 1920s, but most particularly the 1930s. And it has to do with the struggle for liberation, the struggle for revolution, the struggle for a better future for China that gets underway uh, after the overthrow of the old imperial system, 1911, 1912, the, the efforts to try to first construct a sort of liberal bourgeois republic that faltered almost immediately. Uh, and then under the influence and inspiration of the Bolshevik revolution, and it also impacted by the disillusionment with Western liberal democracy after the betrayal of China at the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919, many people in China began to look for an alternative path to a better future. And so people began to turn to Marxism, began to turn to ideas of socialism and communism. People began to gather in reading groups and in other kinds of organizations. There was, of course, also an incipient labor movement and people involved with, with the trade unions and with, uh, with labor in the countryside began to investigate these questions. Of course, in Russia, after the Bolshevik Revolution, as, as the revolution was trying to consolidate its position there, uh, something called the Communist International, or sometimes referred to as the Third International, was formed with the goal of supporting and encouraging and indeed assisting uh, revolutionary movements emerging in, in other parts of the world, uh, including and, and eventually uh, becoming kind of the main priority in the colonial world. Countries, the people who were oppressed by uh, Western imperialism. China, of course, being a huge uh, example of that and a very important uh, component of, of what whatever was going to be the, the global future. So in 1921, uh, with assistance and advice from representatives of the international, uh, a relatively small group, only about a dozen people, gathered in Shanghai and, and had the founding Congress of, of the Communist Party of China and launched uh, their own revolutionary struggle. Uh, that, that, that small grouping represented uh, not much larger membership at that point. There were yeah. only about 65 members of the party across the country. But within just a couple of years, that membership swelled to tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands uh, as, the, as the revolution advanced. The big question was, how should the revolution go forward in China? And uh, at first, the decisions, certain decisions were taken uh, that because the industrial proletariat in China was very small, uh, there should be an alliance with representatives of, of what was called the national unity. There we go. Uh, that's, that's okay. I'm shining light on the situation. It's always um, but uh, uh, you know, the national bourgeoisie took the form of, of the Guomindang, the nationalist party. And so at first, an alliance was forged between the Communist Party and the Nationalist Party because the belief was that such a small proletariat, industrial proletariat, was inadequate to really advance the cause of a socialist revolution in China. That vision stumbled by the late 20s when reactionary elements within the Nationalist Party carried out a split with the communists. Uh, tens of thousands of revolutionary activists, workers, uh, were killed or arrested in Shanghai and in other parts of the country. And by the late 20s, early 30s, the party and the revolution in China was kind of seeking a new path, but not quite yet able to figure that out. But by, the, by 1933, 34, a new vision, a new understanding of the material realities of China began to assert itself, primarily 
articulated by Mao Zedong, who reconceptualized, if you will, the place of the peasantry in China, which was the vast majority of the population, probably 85% of the population were people who lived and worked on the land. And Mao came to see the peasantry in China not as a petty bourgeois class volatile in its political loyalties, which could sort of wildly swing between supporting the working class and going over to the, to the bourgeoisie. But instead, he recognized that the vast majority of agricultural workers in China were, as he articulated it, agricultural proletarians, and therefore constituted a logical ally for the industrial proletariat as it was still in its relatively nascent form. And once that insight began to take, well, to find practical expression uh, in things like the construction of the Jiangxi Soviet, the first of the great base areas of the revolution, where with a population of some 10 million people, the party was able to lead experiments in land reform, in family restructuring, in social policy of different kinds, the wisdom of this insight, the wisdom of, of Mao's vision began to, to be pretty self-evident. The Jiangxi Soviet faced repressive campaigns by the nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek. In 1934, they were forced to abandon that base area and embark on a long march, which over the following year would take them uh, off to the far northwest of China, where a new base area would be established. But very early in that process, in January of 1935, at what's called the Zunyi Conference, the, the, the political perspective of Mao Zedong was formally recognized by the party, and he becomes, in effect, the, the practical leader of the, the CPC. He doesn't literally become elected as chairman until 1945, but, uh, but from the Zunyi Conference on, uh, Mao's insights, Mao's perspective, Mao's political orientation becomes the guiding force uh, for the revolution. And of course, that, that eventually will result uh, in the triumph of that revolutionary struggle. That requires first defeating Japanese imperialism in the war from 1937 to 45, and then defeating the Guomindang reactionaries between 1945 and 1949. But by that point, uh, Mao's insights, Mao's strategy proved to be successful and the People's Republic comes to be established in 1949. Along the way, Mao not only has articulated a, a different analysis of Chinese society, uh, but also has begun to adapt Marxism to Chinese philosophical, uh, the Chinese philosophical environment. During the Yan'an period, he writes major essays like On Practice and On Contradiction. Uh, he also gives the lectures at the Yan'an Forum on Art and Literature exploring ways in which, as, as he puts it, the universal truths of Marxism-Leninism can be adapted to the concrete realities of Chinese experience and Chinese society. So this is sort of the first great iteration of this idea of, of socialism or Marxism with Chinese characteristics, recognizing that historical materialism is not, it's not a blueprint, it's not a template, it's not a schematic or a wiring diagram. It is a methodology of analysis and a mode of, of, of thinking, uh, which then you know, interacts dialectically with practice. So we have theory, practice, theory, and practice. And that has to be grounded not in, a, in an abstraction of what capitalism is or what feudalism was or what socialism might be, but in the, in the material realities that are faced by the revolutionary struggle. Okay? And as I say, both those philosophical insights and the practical experience of recognizing the class nature of Chinese society, the role of agricultural proletarians and industrial proletarians, this strategy proves to be successful, and in 1949, the People's Republic is established. That then leads to the first period of the development of the project of building socialism in China. So when we think about Xi Jinping talking about what he calls the new era, the previous era really begins with, with this first phase of developing socialism in China, what we might think of as 
but certainly the period of Mao's leadership from 1949 mm -hmm. until his death in 1976. And this was a turbulent path. There were, there were deep divisions of, uh, of, uh, of thought within the, the Communist Party. Uh, there were contradictions within Chinese society. There were issues that emerged within the party itself as it went from perhaps a million members in 1949 at the time of liberation to over 10 million a decade later during the Great Leap Forward. Even larger as we moved on down to, to later periods, the Cultural Revolution and the 1970s. Many people that came into the party did so out of sincere revolutionary beliefs and ambitions, but others joined the party for more opportunistic or careerist motivations. Uh, their skills or talents might have been needed to administer the new state, to administer the new economy. But uh, this brought social complications, you know, various in the real world uh, perspectives on class interests. And then, as I say, this was a very turbulent period. It was a period of what's sometimes called the struggle between two lines, uh, where some people had a vision, particularly those centered around Mao Zedong, a vision of advancing the revolution, advancing socialist construction through mass mobilization, releasing the creative, innovative potential of the workers, uh, of the people, while others viewed the process of, of socialist development as, as so challenging and so complex uh, that they prioritized what, uh, what might be called expertise. Uh, the, the contrast was often articulated as reds versus experts. Uh, but the idea of, a, of what they often referred to as a more pragmatic approach, uh, saying that the, the tasks at hand were so important and so sophisticated that those who had the technical knowledge and skills and talents to, to guide this process, should really be allowed to do so, and and the masses of people should basically get along with the program, you know. And these contrasting models of development played themselves out in various ways uh, through the collectivization process in the fifties, uh, through the the process of nationalizing uh, industry in the fifties, through the the challenges of the Great Leap Forward, uh, where the issues of bureaucratization led to deep contradictions and problems. Uh, and then as those began to be resolved in the early 60s, new issues emerged within the party that led to the Cultural Revolution, a great struggle to bring the party back into a more responsible and dynamic relationship with the masses, um, which ran into its own problems and contradictions, uh, reaching in, in many views a high tide with the establishment of the Shanghai Commune in February of 1967, which then was transcended by efforts to restore a new, more revolutionary, more reinvigorated model of party leadership with the, the, the what were called the revolutionary committees, which became the new sort of organizational mode uh, across much of the country. After the Ninth Party Congress in 1969, uh, the struggles over the future of the revolution and the path of socialist development largely returned to internal struggles within the party itself and the period of, of mass mobilization and mass engagement with the questions of the Cultural Revolution began to recede. Those struggles went on through the 70s. This was also, of course, the period where China begins to open up uh, to, the, to the West. Uh, the, the development that had taken place up to the early 1970s had brought about great changes in China, great enhancement of the, the living conditions, the livelihood of the Chinese people, improvements in housing, healthcare, education, all kinds of things. But China still faced serious challenges in terms of, of its economic development and modernization. And the opening to uh, the United States uh, created new conditions which were also shaped by antagonisms that had emerged between uh, the Chinese Revolution and the experience of the Soviet Union, who had been close allies in the 50s, but uh, what's called the Sino-Soviet split deepened through the 60s, a very, very complicated political terrain. 1972, of course, very famously, President Nixon goes to China, 
Shanghai communique is signed in which the United States recognizes that people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait agree there's only one China and Taiwan is part of China, a position which has been the formal and remains the formal position of the American government, even as we do everything possible to provoke China by trying to split Taiwan away today. We can talk about that more later. But this launches the beginnings of a new period in China. It's still playing out contradictions of the struggle between two lines, but now China is able to start attracting uh, foreign investment, not initially from the United States, that doesn't really get underway until the 80s, but Japan starts to put money in, money starts to come in via Hong Kong, and this allows China to start new phases or new stages of economic investment and development. But the real shift, the real change takes place after 1976. 76 is a hugely traumatic year in China. Zhou Enlai, a great revolutionary who had been uh, the prime minister since the founding of the People's Republic, dies in January. In April, uh, there are there's a, a commemorative uh, uh, expression of, of uh, affection for, for Premier Zhou uh, centered in Tiananmen. That gets condemned uh, initially as a counter-revolutionary act, uh, but eventually is seen as, as a popular expression of support for Zhou Enlai. In July, uh, Zhu De, the founder of the Red Army, dies. Later in July, there's a massive earthquake in a city called Tangshan, seen by many as a sort of uh, augury of, of uh, trouble ahead. And on September 9th, Chairman Mao himself uh, goes to, to meet uh, Conrad Marx. And <laughs> Howard's off now, Chicken. Um, that leads very quickly to a shift in the political center. Uh, uh, the, the supporters of uh, the struggles against bureaucratization and the emergence of bourgeois right, as it is called, uh, uh, often referred to as the Gang of Four, Zhang Qing, Yao Yuan, Zhang Chunqiao, and uh, Wang Hongwen, are arrested. Uh, and the party begins to move in a new direction. Uh, leaders like Deng Xiaoping, who had had a very uh, up and down uh, career, to say the least, uh, emerge as, uh, as sort of the new center and launch what comes to be known as the period of reform and opening to the outside. And that is the period in many ways in which we still remain, although there is, I will argue, a, a distinction between uh, the period of the 80s, the 90s, and the first decade of this century, and what Xi Jinping calls the new era, the period really that we, we are in right now. So let me shift and talk about, about that distinction and what, what that's all about. Beginning in, well, really in 78, 79, but especially accelerating as we move into the 80s, um, China embarks upon what I sometimes call a, a path of risky business. Uh, and this is the, the, the idea of using the mechanisms of the market to develop the productive economy. 1979, 30 years after liberation, China had achieved great things. As I've said, you know, in terms of, of improving the lives of the people, raising the material standards of living, extending life expectancy, reducing infant mortality, developing infrastructure uh, all across the board, education, housing, all these kinds of things were much, much better by 1979 than they had been. Uh, there's sometimes today a kind of sense that, that those first 30 years were, were just such a problem. But really, the economy grew between three and a half and four percent every year, steady progress. But in 1979, China still remained a country, a relatively poor country. Uh, and they had achieved an egalitarianism of poverty. But that's not socialism. That's not what socialism is about. The vision. The, the, the insight of Marx, Engels, Lenin, sees socialism not as a society of poverty, but as a society of prosperity and even abundance, from each according to their ability to each according to their work. And eventually, the goal being communism, from each according to their ability to each 
according to their needs. Well, you can't do that unless you have a sufficiency and an abundance of, of the real needs, not the fully churned up commercialized market needs of advertising and all that, a new cell phone every six months or something, but the real human needs to allow each and every individual to fully develop themselves to their greatest potential. The, the, the vision, again, that, that Marx and Engels articulate uh, and has been at the heart of our project, our revolutionary struggle forever. So the new leadership, uh, they decided that this would be the path, that they would use markets to develop the economy. They look back to the way that Marx and Engels had described the rise of the bourgeois economy in the manifesto, recognizing the incredible power of capitalism to develop production, not in a way that was attuned to meeting the social needs of the mass of people, but to generate vast amounts of wealth. They looked back to the precedent of the new economic policies that Lenin put in place after the, the struggles and the destruction of the Civil War and the emergence of the Soviet Union. A, a process, again, of opening up to market mechanisms to get the economy jump-started and underway. Now, of course, that experience lasted only a few years and led, you know, set the stage for, for uh, the processes of industrialization uh, that were pursued in, in the rest of, of the Soviet experience. But in looking at these precedents and in thinking about how to achieve a degree of material prosperity that would create the conditions for socialist distribution at some point in the future, not right down the road, but at some point in the future, this was the venture upon which they embarked. And it has been, in some ways, an incredibly successful venture. There's no question that the Chinese economy, if we look at measures like gross domestic product, uh, expanded through the 80s, the 90s, the first decade of this century. Uh, for 20 years, it grew at more than 10% a year, a remarkable rate of economic development. But that has come at, at tremendous costs. And what's important, I think, to try to understand is that it was understood the, the, the decision makers who chose to embark upon this path, I believe, recognized that there were going to be risks, there were going to be contradictions, there were going to be challenges along the way. Deng Xiaoping very famously said, you know, to get rich is glorious, but some people are going to get rich first. And that set the stage for what has been a complicated and contradictory process. They understood, I believe, that this would lead to inequality. And inequality has expanded tremendously in China. It was a much more egalitarian society in 1979 than it is today. They understood it would lead to corruption as the loosening of, you know, of a planned economy gave rise to opportunities for people in positions of authority in the party, in the government, uh, eventually uh, those who could control private capital to abuse those positions, to abuse that power, to enrich themselves, to enhance their own positions. I don't think they understood quite as clearly as, as, uh, as we certainly do now in retrospect, that it was also gonna to lead to tremendous contradictions in the environment. It was going to lead to pollution of the air, the water, the soil, uh, which would have a negative impact on the lives of people. But the calculation was that that could be a burden that would be borne with a key article, I suppose we could say, of faith, but of commitment, which was that this wasn't simply the abandonment of the economy to the, to the, to the voracious appetites of, of capital and market, because China had a communist party. China had a socialist state. China had a legal system and largely a cultural system that was going to sustain the people through this process of development. So what was critical to this was to maintain the central role of the Communist Party as a Marxist Leninist, as a party committed to the eventual implementation of socialist distribution, and the continuation of the path towards a socialist and communist future. That led to contradictions. 
there's a, a phrase in, in Chinese about uh, crossing the river by feeling the rocks, because this was a venture that, that hadn't been embarked upon. This was an adventure that, uh, or an experiment, if you will, that was very challenging. And, and you know, there wasn't a blueprint. There wasn't, there weren't clear guidelines on how to go forward. In the 1980s, there were great debates within the party about how much the market should be allowed to do about price regulation, for example. Should prices just be thrown open, what's sometimes called shock therapy? Uh, and China managed to avoid uh, uh, you know, going down that path, but there were many in the party who advocated strongly for that, including figures like Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang, right? Um, the contradictions that began to emerge, issues, all these issues of, of corruption and inequality and, and uh, you know, differential development. These led to the, the upheavals of 1989, which initially, I believe, uh, uh, you know, expressed legitimate concerns and, and, and anxieties on the part of some people, uh, particularly young people who often, uh, people being educated, who often felt that perhaps they were being left behind as, as private interests took priority, uh, but which unfortunately morphed over a couple of months into an, an anti-government, anti-party movement, often with uh, the, the cheering from the sidelines of Western media. I remember watching Dan Rather on CBS Evening News from Beijing just being gleeful about how this meant the end of the Communist Party and the final overthrow of the People's Republic. China was going to go through, they didn't call them color revolutions yet, but that sort of transformation. And unfortunately, from within the ranks of, uh, of uh, the demonstrators and the protesters, certain individuals emerged who bought into that vision, saw themselves as, as wanting to provoke uh, the kinds of violence that would lead to, to what they believed would be a, a transformation of China. That sadly led to the events of, of June. No one, I think, thinks that, that it was a great thing that the People's Liberation Army came in and, and uh, you know, brought an end to the occupation of Tiananmen Square and the disruption of the life of the capital. But it was done. And it uh, was done to preserve, once again, the central role of the party. That led, of course, to a, a period of great condemnation of China around the world uh, and a struggle within the leadership, once again, to think about what the direction forward should be. But by 1992, uh, there's a recommitment to reform, but perhaps with a little more sober understanding of the challenges ahead. And that leads to a period that runs from the late 90s down to uh, the end of the first decade of this century. And this is a period where China can be seen to have been biding its time and building its capabilities. This was advice that, again, Deng Xiaoping articulated before his death in 1997. The idea was that, the United, that, that China needed to be engaged with a global system uh, but we had to recognize, or it had to be recognized, that that system was dominated by Western capitalists with the United States as its hegemonic center. So bide your time, build your capacities, basically keep your head down. Don't emphasize the socialist program. Talk about development, talk about it in, in ways that would attract investment, that would attract technology, that would attract organizational knowledge. And again, that was a successful endeavor. It's, it's the 90s and the, and the teen, the, the, the first uh, decade of this century where these fantastic rates of growth uh, played themselves out. It was also, of course, during that period that the deepest contradictions emerged. So that was the era preceding the new era. During that period, not only were the, were was China doing this fighting its time, keeping its head down uh, approach. But in the West, especially in the United States, amongst the political elites here, there was this faith, there was this hope, this dream, if you will, that China would eventually go through a color revolution. That as, as uh, I remember reading article after article, that, that economic liberalization would inevitably lead to political liberalization. And there would be a change, a fundamental change in China. But that was never 
on the cards. That was never the agenda. And the Communist Party served to try to protect and safeguard the socialist mission. Difficult job and, and a, a process which is still very much in play today. By the end of the first decade of this century, a new era gets underway, not only in China, uh, but in America's perceptions of China and, and the attitudes of the American political elite towards China. And I think one of the triggers for that was the global crisis of 2008. Because, you know, as, as, as we remember, in 2008, the American economy, the financial economy first and the broader economy in, in, in tandem with that, went into a deep crisis. Banks collapsed, the federal government took workers' money and paid off the, the, the losers. Uh, you know, the concept of a moral hazard went right out the window the first day. And, uh, you know, the bailouts followed one after another. Millions of people lost their jobs, millions of people lost their homes. Homelessness, which was already a deep crisis, uh, you know, expanded tremendously. Unemployment became a huge problem. It was, a, it was a terrible crisis, not just in the United States, but in Western Europe and other parts of the capitalist world. And in China, 20 million people lost their jobs because demand for Chinese products in the export markets evaporated. Uh, American workers couldn't buy all those things that they went out to get at Walmart um, because they lost their jobs and their homes and they were scrambling to simply get by. So, Demand evaporated, and the workers got laid off, 20 million workers. But the experience of those workers was very different from that of people who were laid off here in the United States, because China has a socialist core that took care of them, what's called the, the household registration system means that everybody in China has a household registration. And there's contradictions in the HUCO system. It's, you know, uh, been a source of friction, and there have been issues about people from the countryside working in the cities that have led to, to various kinds of social problems and challenges. Some solutions have been worked out in particular contexts, but it's still a contentious system. But it meant that people who were laid off could go back to their villages and have housing and have health care and have educational opportunities for their children. Not at the level of the cities, not, you know, maybe at world-class standards or something like that, but they weren't simply abandoned. They weren't thrown on the, you know, the tender mercies of the marketplace. And over the following year or so, as uh, the leadership worked in part to direct the economy a little more towards domestic consumption and away from such a great reliance on export, most of those people wound up either getting back the jobs from which they had been laid off or finding new opportunities for employment. It wasn't great. It wasn't, you know, a free ride or something like that. But people were taken care of in ways that contrasted tremendously with the experience here in the West. And I think some American leaders, some American politicians began to understand that China was not going to change its colors. China was not going to get rid of a system which could do that. In 2011, President Obama, nice liberal Democrat, announces the pivot to Asia, the redeployment of American military assets uh, directed towards the, the containment of, uh, of China to trying to constrain China's future development. Uh, in November of 2011, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, another good liberal, uh, uh, publishes an article in which she calls for a new American Pacific century, right? The idea that the United States needs to be the dominant power in the Pacific, which is really just a standard for controlling and dominating China. So American political elites launched a new era of their own. And the following year, 2012, sees the election of Xi Jinping to the leading positions in China. And of course, he remains in those positions uh, today. And I don't want to, you know, just get up here and sing Xi Jinping's praises. He's, you know, a politician like others. And 
He is a revolutionary and a Marxist, I believe, and he has done some very good things. But, you know, nobody's perfect, and I don't want to suggest that everything he has done is great or that he's completely capable of flawless leadership. But if we look at what has gone on in China over the last decade plus, we can see that very, very clear efforts are being made to address some of the contradictions that have emerged in the course of reform. One of the first things Xi Jinping got involved with was an anti-corruption campaign, which continues to the present, trying to bring people in the state and the party into compliance, trying to make them take responsibility for their actions, trying to curtail uh, the kinds of abuses that had been the source of a lot of anger on the part of ordinary people. That doesn't mean corruption has gone away. It doesn't mean corruption has been eliminated in China, but it does mean that clear efforts are underway uh, and, and I think have been to some extent successful to, to reduce it, to, to limit it, to try to bring it at least under some kind of control. The same is true with questions of inequality. Uh, certainly there, there is significant inequality in China, but on the one hand, people at the bottom of the economic hierarchy today are probably a little better off than the average was 30 or 40 years ago. And China has put tremendous resources into trying to eliminate absolute poverty, at least as defined by the United Nations. That doesn't mean that there's no more poverty in China. I, I, think, I don't think any of us would, would embrace that idea, but it does mean that the base, the, 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 the bottom line has been raised. Uh, uh, the standards set in the global community, if you will, uh, for absolute poverty have, have pretty much been, been breached. You know, that, that people, hundreds of millions of people in China have seen their livelihoods be enhanced and improved. Um, there's still work to be done, but that is, uh, that is a very clear reality. The environment, you know, this is an area where I, I remember living in Beijing in, in an apartment complex over on the northwest side of the city in 2008. And there were days when you couldn't see the ground. I lived on the 25th floor. There were days you couldn't see the ground. The pollution, the haze, uh, the smog was so thick that, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. Um, that's not so much the case anymore for a variety of reasons. China still faces serious environmental contradictions, but they're trying to move away from the dependence on coal. And perhaps most importantly, China is the leading country in the world for the production and consumption of alternative energy, wind energy, solar energy, hydropower, a component of nuclear energy as well, which I'm not particularly happy about, but it's there. Um, and they are investing tremendously in these alternative energy technologies. Um, they make the best and cheapest solar panels in the world, but of course we can't have them in America uh, because of tariffs and decoupling. So, you know, we prioritize demonizing China and, and decoupling from China over trying to save the planet. I mean, it's just, it's pathetic, but that's the realities with which we have to deal. Um, China has not only uh, in the last, in the new era, embarked upon these efforts to address contradictions within the country, but has also undertaken efforts not to take over and dominate the world in some way, but to share experience and share resources with other parts of the world, especially the development. Things like the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which has seen huge amounts of, of investment by China in, we go, in, uh, in other countries, in other developing countries, and has meant that China has contributed not only to advancing the situation of the Chinese people, but to those of, of people in developing countries in Africa, in other parts of Asia, Latin America, even parts of Europe, Italy, Serbia. These are countries that have signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative. So again, the Belt and Road Initiative is it's not a charity operation. It's not a, it's not free grants, uh, you know, from a, from a wealthy donor. It's a it's a uh, an, an initiative of mutual benefit. Certainly, there are things about these investments that will be beneficial to China that will yield positive results for China. 
But China likes to, to articulate this stuff as a win-win, you know, where yes, it's beneficial for China, but it's also, and perhaps even more so, beneficial for the recipient country. Is it perfect? Of course not. Are there flaws? Are there, are there problems? Is there corruption sometimes? Probably. But is it an endeavor very different from that of American imperialism, from the World Bank, or the IMF? You bet it is. You know, China has forgiven tens of millions of dollars recently in, uh, in debt for countries that have run into problems because of the pandemic. They've refinanced hundreds of millions of dollars more uh, in order to keep countries afloat, in order to keep them growing, in order to keep their situations improving, in part so that eventually they'll be able to pay back their debts. But that's important rather than driving them into default and austerity programs. China is routinely criticized, the BRS criticized, because China won't impose political conditions on the recipient countries. You know, the IMF loves to do that. You've got to have these austerity programs, these policies. You've got to cut back on social spending. China doesn't do that. Right? And they get condemned for that by the, by the bourgeois media in the West. Uh, but we should see that as really an effort to build, again, as the Chinese say, a common future for mankind, future of common prosperity, shared development. Well, again, I, I, I don't want to you know, put on too many layers of rose-colored glasses here. I don't want to see that China is, is you know, a worker's paradise or anything like that. But my view is that China is a, a work in progress, that it is a project, an experiment, if you will, it's still underway. There is private capital in China. There are bourgeois elements in China. They don't control the state, although I think some of them would probably like to. So long as the party can, as Xi Jinping has said, remain true and commit to the fulfillment of the original mission of the revolution, so long as that socialist core is maintained, we saw that in practice, in action, again, not without flaws and contradiction during the COVID pandemic when China mobilized party, state, and social resources to make sure that people didn't die, right? Doesn't mean there weren't suffering, doesn't mean there weren't challenges and problems, but fewer than 6,000 people died down till the end of last year a period during which the United States with a quarter of the population of China lost over a million people. The prioritization of basically saving people's lives is what made the difference there. So, you know, I don't think it's a done deal. I don't think we can rest. I don't think the Chinese can rest. I don't think they are resting. I think that, that there are challenges ahead, risks along the way, but what does that mean for us? And here we are in the United States. We're revolutionaries, we're socialists and communists here in the United States. The United States has launched itself into a new Cold War, a war of provocation, a war of relentless demonization of China, making up stories left and right about how bad China is, and pushing China in the South China Sea, around Taiwan, in Hong Kong, trying to provoke China into making a misstep, which could lead to some kind of conflict, which in any real world scenario, people could see would be foolish, but American politicians seem intent upon. I think largely because, you know, no surprise, they're not capable of understanding the complexities of the real world. And they're always, they've always got their eye on you know, the next electoral cycle or the next news cycle, the next fundraising campaign. Democrats and Republicans, you know, who fight over some things are unified in their hostility towards China. And if they compete, it's only to say, who can be more anti-China? I'm more anti-China than you. The pathetic spectacle of the spy balloon, you know, only revealed, only revealed how out of control this is. What a delusional world these politicians live in, right? That's a super challenge for us because these suckers may be delusional, but they also control the strongest military, right? So what is our mission? 
here we are, Party for Socialism and Liberation. We're revolutionaries. We have a vision change, making a more just and equitable world in which those who produce wealth share its distribution. When we think about China, the political work in which I'm primarily engaged, what is our number one task? Fight American imperialism. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's not just in China. It's all around the world. All those bases in all those countries, our ability to fuck with people in, in the Middle East, in South Asia, in Latin America, in, in, in China. Uh, and you know what? In Ukraine, um, this, has got, this has got to be a major, major target. We need to, as the Chinese say, seek truth from facts. That's, that's a big, big project. To be able to talk to people, to educate ourselves, to, to work in our communities, to work in our class, to raise consciousness, as we used to say, to, to bring knowledge and information about what's going on out in the world, about what's happening in China. This is a huge challenge. The American government has worked relentlessly, not only to demonize China, but to try to ensure that that the truth about China doesn't leak in here, doesn't seep in here, shutting down Confucius Institutes, terrorizing Chinese scholars that come to work at American universities, intimidating Chinese graduate students who come to study here, destroying what had been bridges of friendship and understanding so that Americans won't know anything about China except what bourgeois propaganda tells them. We are, you know, we're a cohort that has to fight against that. You know, we have to educate ourselves about that. We need to, however, maintain a position of what I call critical support. As I say, we don't we don't see China as perfect. We don't see China as a worker's paradise. And we don't want to subject ourselves or make ourselves vulnerable to, to, to being simply dismissed as apologists or somehow starry-eyed or delusional about China itself. We need to, when we talk about China, we have to, we have to be ready to talk about the problems and the contradictions. You know, we're historical materialists, we're not idealists, right? We don't we don't wish it to be. You know, we work, we fight to make it be different. And finally, the ultimate goal of all of that is our struggle for a socialist America, struggle for a future here. Um, you know, we have our socialist reconstruction that we're, that we're working towards. And all of these things weave together, fighting American imperialism, seeking truth from facts, critical support, the struggle for socialism in America. This is one struggle, many fronts. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you, Congress. That's nice. <laughs> I am happy to do questions. So please, let's uh, let's get down. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, I want That's to never our strong suit. <laughs> one thing communists love is to talk. No, the one thing communists love is to split. <laughs> but let's not do that today. Right. Yeah, no, I wanted to ask about... Um, a concept that Americans hold near and dear, which is democracy. And I think oftentimes there's a lot of misplaced trust in the democracy of the United States. I mean, the ability to choose between uh, Trump and Biden is, is not much of a choice at all, of course. Um, but leaving that aside, because I think we all sort of probably have a lot of agreement about that. I'm wondering how it is that... Um, democracy is conceived in China, because I think that we're often led to believe that there's only one way to think about what democracy looks like or what it should look like. Um, and of course, one of the really common lines of that you hear in the mainstream media and just in sort of popular discourse is 
that China is a dictatorship, which means it's not democratic. Um, so I'm I'm wondering if you could just comment on on sort of the the concept of democracy in like Chinese society and then um, just anything else that comes to mind. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean uh, the question of democracy is is a big one, and it is something that gets thrown at us every day when we're when we're organizing and and talking to people. Um, and it is a challenge because, as exactly as you say, Americans tend to believe that uh, that there's only one model of democracy. Um, a lot of Americans don't even like, you know, European democracies, right? They, what is all that? Um, if you don't have two parties and you don't have regular elections uh, in which people, you know, get to mark a box or something, uh, how can you talk about democracy? Um, you know, the big thing that gets said about China is that it, it, it's a one party state, right? And, uh, you know, all those, a lot of the stuff that, that you just articulated. So how do we, how can we think about that? What, uh, what would be some indication that there might be some kind of democracy in China? Uh, China, in, 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 in Chinese political discourse, if you will, um, there's a phrase that's called whole process democracy, right? And we should recognize on the one hand that there are actually elections in China. The National People's Congress, for example, the legislative body, uh, is elected. It is an elected body, and it's elected in a kind of stacked hierarchy from local elections in, in primary units up to, you know, higher levels, up to provincial level units, finally to the National Congress, all this. Um, so there's a, you know, there are elections, there's voting that goes on. Um, there's no question that the Communist Party is the dominant participant in that, although not the only one. There are non-party people that get elected to, to things, you know. Um, but it's not, it's not an electoral system like ours, where whoever has money can buy advertising and uh, other things. Um, and, you know, you, you wind up with, with uh, party uh, conventions where, you know, it, it money talks and, and both here walks, you know. I mean, it's just, it's a very, very different system. But I don't think that the electoral question is, is the key to understanding uh, democratic participation. And I think that, that that's a better way to think of democracy. That it's not, it's not a formal structure of electoral politics, but it's a question of political participation. And there we face some interesting challenges when we think about China. Because on the one hand, you can point to the fact that the Chinese Communist Party has almost 100 million members. The numbers go up. Maybe it is 100, but it's in that range, maybe 90, 99, something. Basically, one out of every seven adults in China is a member of the Communist Party. Uh, and that means that they're involved to a greater or lesser degree uh, uh, you know, in political activity, in political study, in political engagement. They are, the idea is, and, and Think in many ways, this is this connects with reality that they will be sources of knowledge and information, a way of articulating the interests of people, a way of communicating. Up, you know, the, the Communist Party, like our party, is a party of democratic centralism, right? So you got to you, know, you communicate up, and there's discussion and all this kind of stuff. Again, of course, it, it exists in reality, not in a, not in a schematic blueprint, but. That's a that's a, a significant level of political activism. That's a, a significant level of political participation, and I think that that's important. You know, when we talk to people, because you know, people here might be registered Democrats or registered Republicans, but how politically engaged are they really? You know, what what does that really mean? Other than that, when you go to vote, you know, it depends on which primary you're going to take part in, if you even do that. And of course, half the people of voting age eligible to vote in this country, don't even bother with that, you know? So there's that. There are also mechanisms in Chinese society, mechanisms for petitioning, mechanisms, you know, sort of hotlines. Sometimes you'll see on, like, when I spend time living in Beijing, I often see on the buses, you know, here's a hotline for reporting corruption or reporting environmental problem or something like that. I mean, you know, those are interesting mechanisms too. Uh, and and that's a that's a mode of political engagement. 
There are non-governmental organizations, a lot of environmental organizations and activities. And one of the things that we see, and again, it depends on your perspective, there are tens of thousands of protests every year in China. I think the figures I've seen are something like 75 or 80,000 incidents of, of political protest in China every year. The bourgeois media likes to say, look how dissatisfied people are. Look how people want to get rid of socialism and the communist system, right? I look at that, I think, damn, here's people taking part in their government. Here's people taking part in political discourse. They have political rights, they have political interests, and they're out there expressing them and, and making demands. Are they always successful? No. You know? Are they always repressed? No. Right? So that's political participation, too. I say that those are all in my view, positive aspects of the question. But there are also, there's a big negative aspect too. And, and again, we have, to, we have to recognize this. One of my, one of the intellectual figures I, I like a lot in China is a, a, a comrade known, his name is Wang Hui. And he wrote a book, uh, actually describing the 1990s, but it's still very relevant today. That, that's called Depoliticized Politics. And his, argument in the book uh, is that uh, a lot of people in China by the 90s, as the economy was growing, as things were changing, as people were becoming more prosperous and people had better livelihoods, a lot of people kind of stepped back. They were like, well, if the government and the party, if they're going to take care of politics, that's fine. I just want to I just want to live my life. I just want to do my job. I just want to, you know, watch TV or, you know, whatever you can to do those things. And there, there's a significant degree of political disengagement um, of letting, letting the party and the government do their job, do their work, as long as conditions are improving, as long as life is getting better. I think a lot there, there is there is a significant truth to this idea of depoliticized politics. I think that that's an area that China faces very serious challenges. I also think that in the new era, Xi Jinping has worked hard to try to inspire people to be more politically. You can't force that on people, but you can certainly try to find ways to draw people in, to encourage people. And some of it, you know, it, it, when, you, when you read about it, especially in the Western media, it can sound kind of rinky-dink, things like he, he articulated this thing called the China dream, you know, all kinds of public posters and stuff about taking care of each other and building a better future. And, you know, it's fine to be cynical and dismissive of that. But, you know, it's, it's not a bad vision. And trying to encourage that, trying to encourage political engagement, I think that's a big project. But I think it's imperative because we want a political society. We want to build a political society of engagement here. The cynicism and passivity that's so endemic in American society, the belief that, yeah, all this sucks, but what can you do about it? You know, that's the huge challenge we face every day as revolutionary organizers. You know, China's not like this, but there are there's a lot of, of I won't say disaffection or alienation, but just like yeah, let them get along. And that's that's a challenge. So I don't want to I don't want to say that China has mass democracy. They have mechanisms for democratic participation. They do have elections, both in the in the state structure and certainly in the party structure. The, the party congress has elected delegates and all that. But it is a challenge, and I think that that's an area that um, you know that that. I mean, we're not in a position to tell them what to do, but that's an area in which I hope that, that further efforts and, and engagement be successful. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of mythology in the West about uh, Chinese surveillance projects, both domestically and abroad. And obviously, recently, that mythology is being used to justify a current surveillance project in the US that we threat that. Um, and I was just curious if you had any comment on how to engage with people who believe a lot of this incorrect information about Chinese state surveillance as being moving towards something that they fear in this case. Sure, sure. These technologies are, are challenging, right? No question about it. I mean, 
I haven't been in China since 2019 because of the pandemic, but um, you know, in, in, in the teens, the last few times I've been there, it's fascinating, you know, not, not to get too anecdotal, but there's, there's these great peanuts in China <laughs> that I really like. So when I'm there, I, I like to go down to the, you know, the equivalent of like, uh, you know, 7-Eleven or something and get a couple of bags of peanuts, right? And you go into a convenience store in China. And if you didn't know better, you'd swear everybody was shoplifting because they're picking stuff up and leaving. But that's because there's these technologies that allow, you know, you've got your, I don't know, your phone or whatever. And when you walk out the door, there's some sensor that just charges your account, you know? So you don't have to go up and pay at the register. You just get your stuff and go. Scarily enough, I saw a, um, I think it's an Amazon shop in the Dallas airport <laughs> that's experimenting with the same thing. I was like, <laughs> But, you know, so, so, you know, these technologies in China, you know, facial recognition and, and, you know, the access to what's on your cell phone and everything, that's real, those exist. And there's a lot of information that's sloshing around that uh, can be extracted by, uh, you know, by these, these mechanisms, by these systems. What happens to that information? You know, where does that information go? Obviously, some of it is going to get put to uses in marketing and other things like that. The state, I'm sure. It's a socialist state. There's not that sharp division between, theoretical division between economy and government that we at least pretend to believe in here, right? So the state has access to a lot of information about it. So it's got to come down in some ways to a question of what do we think about that state, right? Is it a socialist state? Is it a state that's working to improve the livelihoods of its people? Is it a state that puts, as, as, uh, as Xi Jinping likes to say, people-centered development as its priority? Because if it is, maybe we got to grant them a little space of trying to make the best use of these technologies in a positive way. Again, you know, it's not that there aren't going to be contradictions and challenges, but if we believe in the project of building a socialist future and we believe that, you know, the working class through the mechanisms of a government should be the guiding force, their interests should be, you know, what counts. Information is critical to that. The idea eventually, China doesn't have this at this point, but the idea of a return to a fully planned economy is going to be reliant upon knowledge and information, the flow of information, the ability to calibrate policy, economic production, things like that, and of course distribution. The reality is going to be dependent upon technology, information technology. Here in the United States, of course, we got plenty of sophisticated mechanisms, and anybody that thinks that, oh, we don't have a surveillance society here is obviously delusional. Um, you know, every one of us in the room probably has a cell phone and that's, that's, you know, we're giving it up every day. And that information is being used by capital to fine tune uh, their, their engagement with us, their, their efforts to try to get us to buy crap, you know, and make us think we want stuff uh, so that they can maximize their profitability. And the state, the bourgeois state here, a state which I think we probably agree does not have the interests of the masses of people as its primary concern. Um, they're going to use that information for their own purposes. You know, the idea that that all this stuff that Edward Snowden put out has had minimal impact on American political discourse and consciousness. You know, people are like, you want to talk about depoliticized politics, people are like, yeah, I know, you know, they're monitoring my very thoughts, but uh, yeah. At least they get better catalogs in the mayor. <laughs> it's scary. It's scary. To, to minimize all that, it's turned into humor. But, you know, it, it, it's so scary that and I have to laugh at something. So, you know, we're not going to get rid of these techniques. But I think, again, we need to try to educate people to the dangers involved. 
do, if you will, all Marxists here, I trust you. What's the class nature? You know, whose class interests are being served? And I think that's really the only way that uh, that we can we can cope with with that challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Come so at me, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to comment on this say saying like this 40 years of reform and opening, this only a thought that to prove that Chairman Mao was right. Oh, do comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I think Chairman Mao was so I don't have a problem with that. Um and that's why I think that this question of, of political re-engagement of trying to draw the masses literally back into political, uh, not just minimal engagement, but political dynamism to make sure. I mean, if the key to this long-term project is the continued leadership of the party and its ability to redirect resources towards the interests of the people, the party has to stay true to that. And the party has to be held responsible by the masses for them, right? That is, as we learned in the Cultural Revolution, that is a challenging task. But without a close link between the party and the masses, and this is our challenge too, you know? I mean, I don't think we're worried about that right now, but, <laughs> you know, down the road, those could be issues, right? The Revolutionary Party has to have close links to the working class. It has to be a product. It has to be embedded in the working class. Right? I don't know the, the key to, to solving that in China. I don't know. I think the party, I probably have a little more faith in it than I know you do at this point. But I think that that's a key question, is getting that political engagement, that mass participation that, that Mao pushed for over and over again, getting that back as the, the daily reality, that's, that's the great mission. Um, I think that China is on a path that will do that, but not tomorrow. I know you're impatient. <laughs> no, I, I was thinking like, not tomorrow yet, but like, Party, it will be possible, or like it will cause the party to make some sacrifice. Absolutely, absolutely. I against its corrupt bureaucrats, against the capitalists, yeah, against the bourgeoisie class that's in the party. I and and again, we may disagree on this, but I see that as happening. I see the efforts to rein in things like, like the educational sector, the private educational sector, things like trying to control the tech companies in China. You know, are, is that a full-blown program? No, but is it a step in the right direction? I think so. So that's, that's, that's where I need to lean. Yeah. We have a question in the chat. Please. Can we hear more about how the U.S. controls economics in China? Like how Ken mentioned that we're unable to purchase high quality solar panels that are produced there. Oh, well, this is a huge thing right now. Of course, this whole concept of decoupling and the, 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 the relentless invocation of this, this bugbear of national security, you know, that says that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Huawei is gonna is gonna spy on us, you know, because they're gonna put uh, uh, you know backdoor software in, uh, in in our telephones or in our five G uh, technologies and all that. As if uh, you know, the United States doesn't already embed that in in all the other phones that are out there. You know, I mean, the only reason they're worried about that is because we already do that. This is true with so many things, but this idea. Of, you know, trying to prevent, uh, on the one hand, the sale of, as they say, sensitive technologies to China, trying to deny China technological resources and assets that it needs uh, in, in the process of its development. That's one side of it. And the other is trying to keep Chinese products, not, you know, your shoes and your phones and your underwear, but, you know, sensitive products from coming into the United States. It's like solar panels. In, in what universe does that make sense, you know, given the existential crisis for the planet that we face? But, you know, that, that gets thrown under the bus 
uh, because it's it's imperialism that really makes the call on that. So it's a it's 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 a dual track of trying to to isolate China, trying to thwart China's uh, development. Um, we were talking on the way over here today. I, I was reading an article this morning about microchips, and uh, Huawei has achieved for itself uh, a, a a bit of a breakthrough. They've been able to develop um, uh, these these productive capacities in in what's called fourteen nanometer production. You know, which is little tiny bits, but we have three nanometer production capability, a couple generations ahead. We don't want them to get that. We're trying to prevent them from getting it. Are we going to be successful at that? No, because China is investing so much in research and development, technological innovation. They will reach that and they will surpass us at some point. What we're doing now, what the American political and economic elites are doing now is basically shooting ourselves in both feet for the future because we're not going to stop China's development. All we're doing is pissing them off. And so rather than, as Xi Jinping says, seeking a future of common prosperity, we're seeking to, you know, isolate America even further. Big, deep reconfigurations are taking place in the global economy. Uh, and, you know, the world is going to be different in, in the course of your lifetimes, uh, certainly than it has been in mine. Uh, in ways that are going to see China play, once again, the kind of leading role in global affairs that, that they did for a long time until Western imperialism screwed them over in the 19th century. That is, that's just happened. You know? the, the monopoly on modern productive technologies held by the West for a century and a half is over. And the cutting edge of development is, is moved on. So it's short-sighted, it's reckless, it's dangerous, but that's how American political elites especially, think about the world. So the, the so-called decoupling, uh, I think is, is very, it's, it's short-sighted from the interests of the American people because it hurts us, denying us access to technologies, whether it's 5G or 6G communications or solar panels or whatever. But that's, that's part of the circumstances with which we hear. Yeah, so, um, I think you kind of touched on this and kind of started to answer my question earlier. But I was going to ask, you know, given that under the guidance of the Communist Party of China, you know, in the initial phase after the revolution, you know, kind of a private capitalist, you know, you can think of like the socialist era, right? And then under after reform, making up, about you know, private capitalism, accumulation. Uh, so my question would be is like, what, if any, Sort of theoretical framework exists in the Communist Party for like how they would transition to whatever the next is. I think we kind of all envision sort of like a return to the initial post revolutionary era, see private capitalism, power stand, and what that would look like. And again, there's any like theoretical framework for conversations that exist in the party for how that would Yeah, boy, that is a really good question. And I'm afraid I don't have a really good answer for it um, because. The, the party is still navigating a very complex political environment. And I am not aware of a, shall we say, a program or a path having been publicly articulated that would set that up other than in the pretty consistent rhetoric of talking about socialist development, talking about people-centered development. Um, you know, one of the ways in which we think about critical support, one of the ways in which I'm, you know, I would like to see things be a little bit different. There's an awful lot of talk about people and not, in my opinion, enough talk about the working class. Um, you know, the idea of class struggle. And partly that's, you know, a a perhaps understandable, but still uncomfortable sensibility of not wanting to freak these bourgeois elements out too much. Uh, at some point, I certainly hope they're gonna freak them out pretty thoroughly, but uh, you know, as I say, they're, they're still, China has achieved tremendous development, but 
per capita income, per capita product, there is still a fraction of ours. You know, they're able to be at parity with us as a as an economy because it's their country's four times bigger than us, right? But per capita stats, they're still running at it like a quarter of, of what we do here, what we have here. And in some ways, of course, there's also the question that we have 4% of the world's population and consume 29% of global resources. So we can't, we don't want to see China reach that level of consumption, but how do you navigate that? Hey, those are, those are other complex questions. But yeah, I think that, um, you know, I would see if, if, when I think about it, I would see that, that down the road, and I don't know, I can't put a time frame on it, I would like to believe, I'm 73 years old, I would like to believe that it would still be while I'm on the planet, because I would sure like to see it get underway. Um, <laughs> but I don't feel misguided for my entire life. But, you know, <laughs> but, I think that's funny. <laughs> but, um, you know, I would, I would think that, that as a greater degree of material prosperity is achieved, as the opportunities for distribution, you know, can be realized, that, you know, there's already, there have already been efforts to, although I'm afraid they've largely been voluntary, to call upon successful private capital to reinvest, to put money into social services, into building schools or hospitals or whatever, to investing in, in you know, green technologies and things like that. But that has been so far, those have been calls basically for, for paying back. And of course, there are great traditions of that within Chinese society, of that sense of responsibility to the community, that sense of, you know, again, we were talking about this on the way over, the longer historical perspective, um, you know, uh, so I would like to see that move from just why don't you help us out here to you're going to help us out here, and then to you know we're gonna we're gonna see some transformation of of ownership. Keep an interest, but we're gonna we're gonna see the state sector once again expand into some of these areas. That is going to be a long term project. There's a long way to go in terms of development. There's a long way to go in terms even of, of within, within these, these market mechanisms of raising the bottom, you know? Um, but I think that it will, it will have to be, and it can be because of the centrality of the party and the power of the state. It will be an incremental process. It's not gonna be like flipping a light switch. Um, and as I say, I think that there are indications of, of Steps along that path already, trying to rein in various abuses and things, but it's a it's a long road to hoe. And uh, we're, you know, they talk to, again in terms of the rhetoric and discourse. We talk they talk about the being in the primary stage of socialism, the primary stage of socialism. Let alone thinking about getting right? so it's a the long and winding road. But I do again believe that they are on that. Other, yeah. Um, professor, you're obviously a China scholar, um, but also you're like a longtime organizer within like the anti-war movement, right? Like you were a leader of the Students for Democratic Society at Kent in the 70s. Um, and very clearly like the US is due for a new anti-war movement um, mm -hmm. led by the socialists. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are a lot that are at stake here. Um, you know, the same as it used to be in like the 60s, 70s, if not more. Um, can you comment on what is actually at stake if we don't organize an anti-war movement um, and if we fail to organize one? Well, you know, not to be overly dramatic, but how about the nuclear destruction of all life on Earth? I mean, just start someplace. Um, no, I think we live in very, very dangerous times. You know, uh, when I became first became politically active, 1967-68, American imperialism was on the defensive. Right, uh, they were losing the war in Vietnam. Uh, uh, allies uh, in in uh, Europe, uh, France certainly, but even Britain to some extent, 
uh, were, were kind of turning away from what they saw as the, the, the rampant, out of control nature of, of American imperialism. Um, liberation struggles, of course, were still underway in many countries around the world, not only in Vietnam. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we, we saw American imperialism as, as kind of on the defensive, and we saw uh, American capitalism uh, in a crisis, in a deepening crisis, the falling rate of profit, uh, you know, various gains that had been made by the working class, uh, you know, since the 1930s, and certainly since the end of the Second World War. Uh, so that terrain was very different than that. You know, after after the, the ascent of neoliberalism in the, in the 80s, uh, and so, you know, which has so totally converted uh, bourgeois politics here that, uh, you know, people people who used to be seen as as, uh, you know, right wing Republicans would now be mainstream Democrats. Uh, you know, it's it's it, the landscape is very, very different. American imperialism is like a wounded elephant. Now. You know, it's still kind of on the defensive, but but in a much more demented way. And, and that makes it dangerous. Uh, this whole provocational attitude towards China is just being stupid because a war with China would be devastating, even if it didn't go to total nuclear exchange. It would be devastating for everybody on both sides of the straits, and it would be devastating for the American economy uh, and, and, and working people in America. I don't even think, I don't understand how, how American corporate leaders could could even think this was a good idea because it would wipe them out as well. You know, it's just it's just plain dumb. But politicians apparently are even dumber. So you know, it's 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 a very dangerous time, um, and we are we are we are we have our fingers in every pie around the world. Uh, you know, bases, secret bases all over that people don't even know about. Uh, uh, let alone you know the big conflicts that that we see in the headlines every day. So I think that that is a different landscape and the challenges for us, um, both in trying to, to fight for socialist revolution in the United States and in trying to combat American imperialism are, are profound. Um, you know, it wasn't easy in, in the 60s and obviously we did not win. Uh, we made some wins, but we didn't, you know, we didn't win the big one. Um, but it is, it is, um, it's a fight that has to be fought. And again, educating ourselves so that we can we can educate others. I don't even really like to use the word educate, but so that we can organize more effectively. Um, that's that's got to be one of our primary tasks. You know, building our party, building our individual ability to to talk and organize and work. Um, you know, and that's what we can do, and that's what we have to do. Other questions? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for having me here. Everyone there are um, down in the kitchen. There's staff and March if you want to check it out. Um, so you're all welcome to stay and also stay in the chat. So thank you all. <laughs>